Good evening, everyone. My name is Rachel from the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. I appreciate everyone jumping on tonight to join the Iowa DNR in Mitchell County for spring greens and things. Um, we are so excited to start hosting this foraging webinar series. Um, as you can see, Chelsea's out there on site, ready to ready to roll with us tonight. So. Um, I just wanted to welcome everyone in this evening. I'll be behind the computer. So if you have any questions as we get going, feel free to shoot me a chat, uh, drop your questions in the question and answer, or um, let us know, raise your hand. We'd be happy to call on you and, and get your questions answered. Um, I am recording this webinar so that we can send it out after if folks want to review or if they weren't able to make it tonight um, so we can we can get it out to them. So without any further ado, I'm going to throw it over to Chelsea and, and let her take it away. All right. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. And um, yes, I am on site and I am up in northern Iowa and we got snow this morning. <laughs> so it is quite chilly. Um, but even with the weather being really cold, there are still yummy things to be found. Um, so just a little bit of my background. I know um, that it's there's a lot of things to find on the internet. There's a lot of things to find on Facebook about wild edibles, but my background in wild edibles is um, I am a naturalist for Mitchell County Conservation Board. I have a degree in animal ecology, and um, I also took quite a few plant species in college and as well as mycology. So I have um, coming up next month, a mushroom special. So we'll be talking mushrooms then. Um, but I've been teaching in Mitchell County for over nine years, and I've been teaching wild edibles for over 11 years. And I haven't lost anybody yet, so, uh, or myself. So just a little bit of credibility there. I'm also a, um, now a certified um, morel and oyster mushroom identification um, specialist. And um, I also teach at different counties, different events across the state, this being one of them. I also will be teaching next weekend at the Iowa DNR Bow, Becoming an Outdoors Woman. Um, I also help teach at the Midwest Wild Harvest Festival, um, and we'll be talking about that a little bit later, as well as some of the people involved there. Um, it is truly a passion of mine. Um, it's just amazing to know the plants out here, um, to put a name with a face kind of a thing. And it's a great additional activity to whatever outdoor recreation you might be doing. So whether you're a hunter, a fisher, a hiker, a bird watcher, a geocacher, a slackliner, anything outside, foraging is another great way to interact with our environment and a great way to learn about how we can help protect it and help promote um, the conservation of our wild natural resources. So um, that's kind of where I wanted to start my class today. Um, I also wanted to let you know, as Rachel said, this is pretty, you know, free flow. I'm here to answer questions. Just feel free to jump in at any time if you have any questions or if I need to clarify something a little bit more. But the plan for this class is we're going to talk safety and sustainability first. Uh, we're going to talk equipment. We're going to talk resources. And then uh, we're going to go on a walk. So you're actually going to come along on a walk with me through the woods. Um, I actually have a fairly easy path. So hopefully it's not too crunchy. And we're gonna look at a few common spring species. And then to finish, we'll talk about some of the ways to use those species, as well as a place to find more information, um, including some of my in-person classes that I'll be hosting here in Mitchell County. So with that, um, I have seen, especially with the circumstances of the past year, a huge increase in people wanting to learn more about how to live more sustainably off the land, um, how to investigate their food sources and eat more locally. Um, or in a survival situation, what kind of things do I need to know to be able to feed my family, to be able to feed myself if, you know, worst comes to worst and I have to survive off the land. And so um, huge increase in foraging. And also that means a huge increase in people asking questions and um, some places are reputable, some places are not as far as who can you believe. So, um, and also how to, to forage in an ethical, sustainable way. 
So since there is such an increase, that's where I wanted to start. Um, there are a couple great resources on Facebook, uh, Midwest Wild Edible and Forager Society. Um, Iowa Foragers is good as well. Um, and then there are a couple events that are really nice. Um, if you get a chance to attend an in-person event, um, the local Prairie States Mushroom Club is great for Iowa if you want to learn more about mushrooms. And then I will be hosting a few classes um, here in Mitchell County coming up, going along with these webinars. So you're curious. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. weren't. Um, what or where is a good place to start? So it's really easy to become overwhelmed with all of the foraging information. Just looking behind me, I see lots of plant friends. I, I can call them by name. Some of them are edible, some of them are not. Some of them are just a pretty face. Some of them are medicinal. Um, but for the average person, where do you start? How do you get to, to know some of these plants without overwhelming yourself and getting discouraged that way? So my recommendation is um, always start with a good source. And some of my favorites, I actually have them right here on the ground. So I'm gonna drop down and grab a few of my favorite book sources. So I teach at the Midwest Wild Harvest Festival. Um, that's usually the third weekend in September every year. And it's an event that has um, grown and because of the people involved. So Sam Thayer has an excellent set of three books. So The Forager's Harvest, Nature's Garden, and his latest is Incredible Wild Edibles. The reason I love these books is not only are they friends of mine, but um, they truly teach you how to know a plant, not just how to recognize it, not just is it edible, but how to know a plant. And when I teach in my classes and with these webinars, I my hope for you is as you continue in your foraging journey, whether it's just in your backyard or in larger open spaces, wild spaces is I want you to learn how to identify plants and how to know plants. So at the end of the day, your very last question is, can I eat this? And then how do I know one way or the other? Um, so Sam's books are great because of that. Um, he talks about, again, how to know a plant, where it grows, who likes to grow around it, um, what season it's growing in, what plant parts are edible, how to harvest and prepare those plant parts, but he does not include any recipes. And so he leaves that flavor exploration up to you and your own preferences. Uh, I also really like his books because in the beginning of each one of them, which is really, really handy, he has a chart based on when these plants are coming in and out of prime harvest times. He's located in Wisconsin, kind of central northern Wisconsin. And so his timeline is very similar to ours here in Iowa, maybe off a, a week at the very most. And so if you're going to be traveling or if you're like, okay, after this class, what can I look for in my area? Or what can I be looking forward to when we go on vacation next month or whatever it may be? You can kind of look ahead and see what's going on in your area. Um, it's also a great way to plan your harvest. So if you really truly want to have more wild foods in your diet, you can kind of plan out throughout the year. Like this is the time of year we're going to be looking for this plant. This is the time of year that we're going to harvest these seeds. This is the time of year when these fruits are going to be ripe. And so you can kind of time out, just like when you have your garden, you can kind of um, plan out your harvest. So yes, any of the three books by Sam Thayer are excellent. Um, they do have a store that you can order directly from them and they're very sweet. So interesting, interesting books and so helpful to beginning foragers. A couple other books that... I really enjoy um, for plants, for green things. Um, I do have some mushroom guides, but we'll talk about that at next month's webinar. Um, but some other really helpful ones include um, Teresa Maroney's set of books. She's got wild berries and fruits. She also has weeds of the upper Midwest. And a lot of the plants that we call weeds 
are actually super beneficial in edibility, perhaps medicinally. And sometimes we're brought here intentionally for those purposes instead of just being considered weeds. So this is kind of a handy one, especially if you're foraging, um, just starting off like in a more urban setting, or if you have like a small, you know, suburban yard, um, this is a really great one to start exploring some of the plants that may be just hiding outside your back door. I also really like to promote uh, my friend Mike's book. So uh, Mike is the first naturalist in Iowa um, and he lives in Southern Iowa. He wrote this book um, as an intended guide for uh, beginning foragers and especially any foraging families. So there's a lot of activities in here um, having to do with children and how to incorporate foraging if you have children um, into your life. And it's got about 20 plants. And so it's a really easy place to start as far as getting into foraging. Um, very common plants throughout the whole state. So Mike Crable's Scout's Guide. He also has a new book, um, just kind of a memoir. It's called A Forager's Life. I don't happen to have that with me here today, but that's another good read to help inspire you on your foraging journey. This is the book I will probably um, be referencing a little bit more today on this subject. So this is Edible Wild Plants um, by John Callis. And um, I've gotten the pleasure of getting to chaperone and meet him at the Midwest Wild um, Harvest Festival. And so we're Facebook friends and he leads some really interesting classes. But the reason I liked this book, especially for today, um, is it is mostly green things. So um, not necessarily just in the spring, but lots and lots of green things in this book. And he also goes so far as to, um, in the back of the book, he has started to explore uh, the nutrition values of different plants, wild plants, and compared to their domestic relatives or um, anything we can kind of compare domestic food-wise. So, you know, vitamins and micronutrients, what is inside those plants besides time outside, besides, um, you know, getting some ex exercise, harvesting these things. Nutritionally, how dense are these plants? I know you guys can't read this, um, but this is a chart comparing um, nutrient values in 100 grams of wild greens. So we have a whole list of different wild greens here and their nutrition values. So really quite interesting work that he's doing as far as figuring out the nutrition value. And that's kind of a good place to jump into my ne next subject. So with wild edibles, with wild anything, um, there is a safety concern. A lot of people are afraid, like, as you get into this, you'll have your family and friends say, what are you doing? You're crazy. You can't eat that. That's a weed or you're going to, you're going to poison yourself. Um, the foods that are available to us, um, in nature are so extremely nutrient dense. Um, and with proper identification skills, there should be no concern over um, consuming some of them. Um, but as with domestic foods, everybody has their own um, preferences as far as taste, but also every body is different in, as far as what they can tolerate. Um, so there are people that are allergic to domestic foods. There may be people that are allergic to their wild relatives. Every food that we consume that is a real food not a processed food, has its origins somewhere in the wild. And so this journey into foraging wild edibles is kind of rediscovering, um, rediscovering the foods that built us as humans. And it's, it's a fun journey and it's a tasty journey. And you can no longer, after even exploring a few wild edibles, walk down the street without recognizing a friend and saying, oh, that's this plant. I know I can eat that and I can make this with it and it tastes like this. And then you're, like I said, your family is going to probably think you're crazy. Um, but then once you start sharing the things with them, they'll probably still think you're crazy, but at least the food will be good. So um, a couple other fun books to um, help you to figure out what you're going to do with some of these plants after you have identified them, harvested them correctly and sustainably, um, brought them home are these two books. 
So this is a book that um, I had a hard time finding. I think I found it in a bookstore up in Duluth. I'm not sure if it's in print anymore, but um, it's called Plant Works. And it's got some really simple recipes as far as what to do with some of these wild edibles. Um, and it's very, very simply laid out. There's actually only a few color pictures um, as far as just trying to like comment Danny Lane. Um, there's a drawing, a few common pictures, a little bit of information, and then a recipe or two associated with that plant. It's also another good one for families. And for anything in your backyard, if that's where you want to start, um, Backyard Foraging by Ellen Zekos is great. Um, she, at this time, was based out of New York. And so there are a few plants that we do not have here, but um, most of them are going to be pretty common to your backyard or fairly easy to find. Something like hostas and daylilies, you can find recipes there. So, um, those are some great resources. I will share with uh, Rachel and she can share with you some other resources that I like to use. My whole book list, um, some websites, those types of things to find more information. Also, I'll share my information. So if anybody ever has questions, email me, Facebook me, um, text me a picture. I love those questions and no question is too silly. Um, at the end of the day, if you've gone through all your identification um, and you're still unsure, ask somebody like me, or obviously don't eat it unless you're 100% sure you have what you think you have. Um, any questions I get in help keep me current and my identification skills up to date. And so I love to see people out foraging and exploring, even if it's something as simple as a dandelion, um, it's awesome. I have a friend who's just been messaging me this weekend. Um, she is making dandelion jelly for the first time and she's super excited. So um, those things really make me happy to know that people are out and about um, engaging with their environment that way. So um, how do you safely harvest? Not only for your safety, um, but also for the safety of the environment. So there is kind of an unwritten rule with foraging that um, we are going to be ethical foragers. Um, we are going to be sustainable in our practices and also in general, just good stewards of the land. So always have with you a bag to pick up garbage because there is always something to pick up, unfortunately. Um, so always bring something with you to pick up garbage, leave the place cleaner than you found it and take care of the plants for everybody, not just for yourself. So I'm actually gonna show an example um, here in just a little bit of a, when we go on our walk that um, a population of plants that would be okay to harvest from and harvest um, a little bit more and maybe a, a group that is not so okay. Um, so the rule generally is um, if it's a sparsely populated plant, um, probably best not to harvest that plant. My great example today is going to be ramps. Um, and it's a plant that is blowing up on any foraging page right now because it is up. It is the time to harvest ramps um, or wild leeks. Um, there are two varieties, one some with a, a white bulb and some with a little bit of a reddish stem and reddish coating on that bulb. Um, both are edible, but I will show you those in a little bit. They are notoriously slow growers. And so an ethical way to harvest ramps would be just to take a single leaf from a clump that has a couple leaves, two or three, and from a population that's fairly dense. So where I'm at here has a population of ramps that is fairly dense, um, but still I would only be picking a leaf or two from every clump of plants. If I had walked into a woodland where there was only two or three clumps, I would not harvest that plant. Um, it takes about seven years to start to reproduce as with some of these others. So if we take the whole bulb, there's no more, there's no more ramps there. There's nothing to create seeds to spread and grow more. Um, but a good rule of thumb to follow, if you do have a large population of a particular plant is one third. So one third for reproduction of that plant and health of that, of that plant population, one third for wildlife use. So if there is deer or raccoons or chipmunks or whoever using those plants or insects like butterflies pollinating that are using those plants, leave one third for them. 
And that means one third can be something you take home. Now, some plants um, like garlic mustard is extremely invasive and um, troublesome in our woodlands. So go ahead and harvest all of it. There's never a time where you're not going to be able to, to harvest garlic mustard. Um, although it is good to keep an eye out on the regulations from the properties where you are harvesting from. So I'll get to that in just a second. Um, dandelions also, typically if you're like, hey, I see you have a bunch of dandelions in your yard. Can I come pick them? As long as they haven't sprayed, um, most people are gonna say, yes, go ahead, have at it, pick all of the dandelions you want. So um, knowing a little bit of your history on the plants themselves will help your, your foraging and your harvesting as well. So where can you harvest and where can you harvest safely? Um, so in Iowa, our state parks have rules in place for foraging. You can harvest berries and fruits, mushrooms, nuts, asparagus, um, and I think there might be one other thing. I'd have to look at the regulations for sure. Um, so that means you cannot harvest um, fiddlehead ferns. You cannot harvest ramps from state public areas because those are not fruits, seeds, nuts, um, or berries. So or mushrooms. Um, on county properties, like I am a county employee, we tend to follow those state rules, although sometimes there are no rules in place. Um, so it's best to ask whoever is the authority over that property. On private property, obviously ask permission. And also if you can ask if there has been any spraying nearby. And that's another thing to watch out for along field edges and roads. Um, so there can be runoff, there can be chemical spray, drift, um, those types of things that generally where you would like to avoid in our foraging from um, more natural populations of plants. So watch out for those things. Um, when you are going out in the wild at any point, always tell somebody where you're going. Um, when you plan to be back, take a friend with you. Uh, it's always nice to have an extra hand harvesting and make sure you have a water bottle, sunscreen, any medications, those types of general outdoor safety rules to follow as well. Um, it looks like I have a few comments in the chat. So I'm going to take a peek at that. If you have any questions, um, yeah, just feel free to, to shout out to me. Maybe I cannot see. There's the chat. Okay, perfect. We want to do, yes, people that have bees want their dandelions, absolutely. Um, that's a great source for um, spring foraging for bees. And actually, um, anything made with dandelions tastes an awful lot like honey. So, uh, yes, a good, good tidbit there. So, always ask uh, is, a, is a good rule. And, and that's private or, um, what was the plant that I mentioned? Ramps, yes. So, um, it's an allium species. It's an onion family member. It smells like onions. It kind of smells like a very strong mix of onion, a little bit of garlic. I'll show you that here when we go on our plant walk here in just a little bit. Um, so I'll show you how to identify that. Um, there are a couple others I'll mention on their, their life cycle. It does take quite a long time as well. Um, some of the gear that you're going to need. So... Um, like I said, it's very cold up here in the north region of Iowa today. I think we got a high of maybe, maybe 40. It's probably 30, 37, 38, something right now. Um, but the sun is peeking through. It's quite nice. So being prepared for the weather is a great, great tip to stay safe and stay comfortable and have a good time while you're out foraging. Um, but with any hobby, you need some tools. You need some fun gear. So it's simple as um, a good guidebook and a bag is pretty much all you might need. So I have just a backpack here. I do like backpacks um, because then you have your hands free. Inside my backpack, I keep different bags. Um, these kind of um, drawstring bags are great as well as paper bags. It's a great way to keep um, anything you harvest separated. So you're not just mixing all of your greens together and then 
um, not quite sure what you actually have. So you could have a bag for ramps. You could have a bag for fiddlehead ferns. You could have a bag for violets. You could have a bag for whatever and keep everything nice and separate. Um, it also helps decrease any transfer of dirt that you might have in there. So it keeps things a little bit cleaner. Um, I also keep a pair of scissors. That'll be from one of my favorite wild greens, spring greens coming up down the hill here. Um, stinging nettles is, these are really handy for that. Um, as well as a pair of gloves. So I packed my warm gloves today. Like I said, it is very cold. Um, so a pair of gloves for not only harvesting ramps, but um, when it's chilly. I also have, can't beat a good pocket knife. You don't need anything crazy. Um, this is just a single, single blade, good for cutting um, stems, good for cutting mushrooms, those types of things. I do keep in here something bright. So I'm oh, gonna adjust that quite a bit. Um, so something bright, whether it be a hat or um, a vest, um, blaze orange is always good. Right now is turkey season. So um, I am also a turkey hunter and um, we are full camo when we're in the woods. So us being able to see anybody else in the woods is awesome. And no wearing red, white, and blue on your head this time of year. <laughs> so blazed orange is always a good choice. Um, anything bright and obnoxious is great. Although I, I gently tease that, you know, if you're going to be hunting morels, which again, we'll talk mushrooms next time. Camouflage so nobody finds your spots, but mostly that's just teasing. Um, I do want people to be safe and be seen when they're out in the woods. So something bright um, to help you out. I also keep in here a notebook for keeping track of my finds. And like I said, I do throw in a few guides, simple things in my pack just to double check. I never want to be complacent in my identification and um, make a mistake. So I always check even after years and years and years of doing this and being a, an expert in the field. A trowel is a nice thing to have if you are digging roots or tubers of any kind. And one must always have a good walking stick. So mine has a lovely little embellishment on the end here. Um, this was made by my late father-in-law who added a special feature. Um, this is, I'm not even sure what he made this out of, but it's a little metal piece. So I can use this as a digger, as a digging stick as well. Um, I'll tell you more about walking sticks and mushroom hunting on our next, our next webinar. So, but always good to have one of these helps you up hills, helps stabilize you while you're harvesting. Um, it's also good to help move plants out of the way and peek under, um, or uh, I actually wanna add a little hook on the end so I can grab branches and pull them down. I'm not very tall. And so in the summertime when I'm harvesting berries, being able to pull down a branch would be quite helpful. So a good walking stick. Uh, water bottle, gotta stay hydrated. Um, if you are, and I'm assuming most of you are, just starting off, it is okay. I see a lot of times on foraging pages, people yelling about this, but it is okay to harvest a few specimens of a plant to take back home with you to learn how to identify it. Um, some people yell at beginners that are like harvesting something. Why would you harvest something without knowing what it was? Um, generally that's when they have harvested a lot of a plant and not being sure. Um, but if you wanted to pick a leaf or two or if there was a large population of ramps, take it home, look at your reference books because maybe you don't wanna carry all three of Sam's books with you in the woods. It is okay. That is an excellent way to learn is by being in the woods, being in the field, taking a specimen home, comparing it to a book, comparing it to an online credible source and figuring out for sure what you have. So that way, when you see it in the field next time, you'll know for sure. Yes, that is my plant, nope. It wasn't, so it must be something else I need to keep looking. Um, so it is okay to do that. Just again, be mindful of the population and only harvest you know, one or two pieces, one or two specimens to help you in your identification. 
for identification, um, I do like um, people to be familiar with some of the terminology. So the way a plant branches, um, the way the leaves are. So is it a basil rosette? Um, compare it with the leaf lanceolate. Um, does it look like a lance? So some of those um, botanical terminology can be kind of tricky. tricky. Um, but as you read, look up words. Um, I do have a bio botanical dictionary um, that is quite helpful for learning what some of those terms mean. Um, but go through, um, especially if you can find a, um, a uh, it's a binomial nomenclature and it's a dichotomous key. So a dichotomous key has two choices. Your plant is this or that. And it's a choose your adventure as you go through the list. Um, so that's where it's helpful to have a specimen and your book at the same place. Um, so anytime you have a, a book with a dichotomous key in it, um, I feel like those are really helpful for beginners um, just because it's one choice or another. A lot of books do have those begin at the beginning. Um, again, I'm gonna reference a mushroom book, but at the very beginning, it has a dichotomous key, just so you can kind of see what it looks like. So we have one A, one B, and you go down the list to try to find your plant. Okay, um, are there any questions? up to this point, because we are just about ready to go for our walk. I'll give you guys a second to, to type in. I'll check the chat as well. My sorry, my nose is running because it is chilly out here. Okay, um, like I said, don't be afraid to shout out if you have questions, um, I'm here. I'm not, we're not in a formal class, so we're here to have a good time. Um, we're gonna go for a little walk um, down the road here and identify a few of the key species that are out um, and they should be out across the state. Um, we're gonna start, where I'm at is um, a habitat that is upper woodland and then it drifts down to the river bottom, right? But you can kind of see the river right there. That's the Cedar River. Um, so we have a pretty, in pretty steep change in habitat from the top of the park down to the bottom of the park. So I am in um, Mitchell County, so Osage, and um, that is where my office is based out of, is where I'm at. So everybody that is south, which is everybody, because we are right on the border, um, these are all plants that should be up in your areas as well. Um, of course, today is really cold, like I said, so all of my flowers are all closed up, um, but I will try to do my best to show you some of the, the spring greens. Now, these are, um, again, pretty common and pretty easy to identify for a beginner. Um, I'm not gonna show you things that are incredibly hard um, to identify because I want you guys to be able to go out and after this webinar, maybe after it warms up a little bit, um, to, to go out and see if you can find these in your local park. Um, not necessarily to eat, but just so you get familiar with identifying them. So I'm actually gonna grab the iPod and um, iPad and uh, take you with me. So it's gonna be a little bit jostly and um, there's gonna be a little bit of crunching, but this would be how my walk is if you were here with me in person. We just go along and see what we can find. I do have a few things picked out, but um, we're just gonna go for a walk. So um, I did say, ask, somebody asked where I was from. Uh, again, North Iowa, Mitchell County, Osage area. And to go along with this webinar, if you do want to learn more um, and are able and don't mind the drive, um, I'm gonna be hosting a Spring Greens in-person workshop this weekend um, here at my nature center in Osage from nine to noon. And we will be covering a lot of the same stuff, um, but it is a hands-on class, so it will be Harvest, yeah, identify, identifying, harvesting, um, cooking, and eating. So you actually get to taste some of these things, um, which is a big part of my classes. Uh, I will be doing more classes like that. So every one of these webinars that is with the DNR, I have an in-person class associated with it. So next month we have um, fungi and flowers. And so 
um, we'll be doing, I'll be doing an in-person class. It's actually gonna be just before, so it's May 8th. Um, and then the webinar is just the Tuesday following. So another in-person class. Um, all the classes are on weekends right now. Um, the webinars are on a weeknight. It's just so I have, because it's a longer hands-on class, um, they are not always in Osage. I do travel around to different parts of the county, um, different parks. So next month's class will be in one of our parks called the New Haven Potholes. Um, it is probably about six miles east of here. So yes, um, there will be some registration information posted in the chat and um, it's all available on our, my county Facebook page. So Mitchell County Conservation Board, I just posted all those on a Friday and I'll keep posting more, so. Um, yeah, if you can join me in person, that would be awesome. So uh, it's always fun to see new faces and new, new people excited about foraging. So thank you for the questions. Um, I will also be teaching at Bow. So if anybody's gonna be at Bow this next weekend, I'll be teaching two foraging classes in a um, after the harvest, so like game processing and preservation class. So I'm assuming most of mine are filled up. Rachel would probably have that information, but I will be around if you're at Bo and that's the And I do have um, some classes that I handed out as a fundraiser for my county conservation board um, and for my naturalist organization. So there's a couple counties. I think Winnesheet County has one. Um, and I think there's one or two other counties that have a wild edibles program with Chelsea that they, they bid on and that they won. Um, there's a barred owl joining us. So he's over, he's over there. Um, so that will be sometime this year um, in other parts of the state. So, but those are yet to be scheduled with those people that won won a class with me. So great questions. I think I think I saw them all. Um, let me just check here. Yeah, ladies getting active, getting together outside. Okay, I'm going to grab my stick and my bag and the iPad and we're gonna go for a walk. I'm also gonna drive, grab a drink quick. Actually, I'm going to end the class down, down the hill a ways here. So I'm going to mention a few books that I don't really want to carry with me along the walk. So after you have, after you've identified your plants, you've gotten familiar with the flavors, um, your body is adjusted to them and likes them. Here are a couple of my favorite recipe books. And they're just beautiful and inspiring to look through. Um, I recently discovered a couple Instagram posts or pages that also have amazingly gorgeous wild food photos and recipes. Uh, Gather Victoria is one of them and The Wondersmith is another. So if you're wanting some beautiful inspiration, those are, those are so nice to look at, especially when the weather's yucky. Um, but this book, um, Cooking Wild has lovely, lovely wild edible things in it. It's not specific to just greens. It's kind of everything, including um, wild game, um, but just lovely, inspiring dishes, combining wild game, wild edibles, and the beginning of the book, you know it's going to be good when it's featuring morels at the beginning. Another stunningly gorgeous book is Forage Harvest Feast, a wild inspired cuisine. Um, just amazing, amazing things in here. Um, like you wanna cook, I wanna cook everything um, in them. And so af again, after you've identified your plants, um, start cooking. I have a book addiction, I can't tell. Um, and, Especially if I saw that maybe there's some uh, ladies getting together for a fun girls day. Wildcrafted cocktails by my friend Ellen. Uh, again, stunning photos and uh, super tasty treats in there.
for the adults only, of course. So let's go for a walk. All right, I'm gonna grab my stick. And I'm gonna grab the iPad. I'm borrowing my iPad from one of the schools here, so. All right, so I'm gonna walk so I'm not so crunchy. First group of plants. Okay, so here's one. And like I said, I apologize, I cannot control the weather as far as my flowers not really blooming <laughs> or having their blossoms open right now. But um, so right now is the time for our spring ephemerals. These plants put on their show, pretty short lived. Um, here in Iowa, it's, it's really quite, quite beautiful. Um, so get out in the spring as soon as you can and start finding some of these things. But here is one of my favorites. Oh, I'm gonna have to move. There we go. So I'm learning how to use this. Here we go. So this, I'm gonna try to focus in on it here. This is trout lily. Um, dog tooth violet is another name. I prefer dog to or um, trout lily because of those leaves. And so I think of the spots on a trout. Um, they will pretty much be carpeting any kind of woodland floor. They're not very conspicuous as with most spring ephemerals. So it's only about five inches tall, but trout lily, um, the leaves are edible as well as there is a small little root down at the bottom. Um, but generally people will harvest a few of those leaves to throw in salads. Um, but it's one of my favorite little friends to start seeing out in the woods. I love, love those speckly leaves. On a sunny day, that flower would be open. Okay. Chelsea, so just, yeah. What color flower would it be if it were open? Um, kind of a pinkish white. And before I get too far, I better get my internet to take with me. <laughs> Otherwise, we would have had a short webinar. There we go. Somebody else, just as I was walking back here. Where did they go? I'm gonna turn around and look from the other direction again. Most of these spring things are very small. Okay, we'll find another. Ah, okay. Let me turn my camera around. No flower, but one of the most common spring edibles that children can identify as well. So this is one of the many species of viola or violets. Got that heart-shaped leaf. Edge. No or anything on the stem. This one happens to have kind of a, a dark stem. A few very fine hairs, but nothing, nothing too conspicuous. Um, the flowers come in purple, um, yellow, kind of a white with purple stripes. So um, all three of those varieties, there's a lot of different varieties of violet. Um, most commonly the purple ones are probably gonna be in your yard. And um, the leaves are edible, the flowers are edible. Um, the flowers are gonna have that pretty conspicuous um, five petal 
blossom with the center on, on the bottom having um, some more of those stripes or um, kind of more definition. That's sort of the landing pad for bees to get in there and drink the nectar. So there's nectar in there. Um, the leaves kind of have a nice pleasant green taste. Um, again, great for salads, nice and tender. You don't have to, to boil them or anything like that before you eat them. Um, just make sure they're clean, give them a rinse. And um, the flowers have a, a mild sweet taste. Plus they're really fun with kids to do some experiments um, making syrups and jellies, especially if you add um, if you add lemon juice, it changes the color. So kind of some fun, some fun experiments there. All right, we're gonna keep walking along here, crunching. I'm gonna be kind of selective about which plants I'm showing you because again, I don't want you to be overwhelmed with any of this. I want you to be able to go out and recognize a few things. There's also the springtime. Kind of a good reminder of what's to come. Not necessarily right now. So one of the oddest, one of the oddest looking fellows in the woods here. These umbrellas are May apples. This one's actually a mature one. You can see there will be two, one, two, two umbrellas with a flower in the middle. That flower will hang, hang below the leaves. Now these are not edible. Um, in fact, the whole plant is toxic, except for the ripe fruit, which I tell people um, in my foraging adventures, mayapple fruits are my white whale. Um, they are absolutely delicious. Um, they taste very tropical, like um, pineapple and mango and a little bit of banana perhaps in there. Totally not something you'd expect from Iowa but everybody else in the woods knows they're delicious too. So every squirrel, every chipmunk, every raccoon, every deer that see it every day, all day, know exactly when it's ripe. Unlike us humans, um, they usually get to it first. So I have a friend who actually hand pollinates May apples to ensure that he'll get a few. There'll be enough to go around that he'll get a few and it's incredible. Um, I did see a question, how do you know when they're ripe? So they generally ripen later in the season. Um, so midsummer, early fall, and there'll be a green, one single green round fruit hanging from that stalk. Um, and when it starts to look like an overripe banana is when it's ripe enough to eat. And no, you can't pick them and put them on the counter and let them ripen. They have to ripen on the vine. Um, so starting to get nice, bright, or even a little bit dark yellow, golden yellow, wrinkly and perhaps even a few bruises on them is when you know they're ripe. Otherwise they're too too hard, not flavorful and not, not really all that good for you. Um, while I'm down here, here is one of the plants of the season. I've mentioned it a few times now. Um, so these woods here are full of ramps. So this would be an area that if I ask the permissions, um, looked into the regulations and saw that it would be okay to harvest plant material, that it would be okay to harvest some ramps. I will show you something just over here that a lot of times people confuse for ramps or they'll, they'll see it in the woods and they'll pick it and ask on the forums and the web pages and the Facebook pages, is this ramps? Um, so ramps, like I mentioned before, are in the allium family, the onion and garlic family. And um, there's generally two varieties here in Iowa. I would say the most common that I see are, is this red stemmed variety. Um, there's a, a white stemmed variety. So this 
is a little clump of ramps and there are four leaves here. So to be sustainable, I would probably pick one leaf from this clump. I'd go over there and find another leaf. I'd go over there and find another leaf. I'd spread my collection out and I would not be harvesting the bulbs unless I was in a really thickly populated area. Um, so one of the key things, because it is a member of the onion garlic family, is the smell. I just walked back here to look at the maples and I smell like I'm sitting in a batch of a patch of onions because I literally am. Um, so a couple things to look for. Um, they have parallel veination. So the little bits, the little veins, the little lines on these leaves are parallel to each other. They go from the main stem here all the way down to the tip are very parallel. Um, they are smooth. There is no, no teeth on the edge of that leaf. And this, this stem is really characteristic. So um, they're really quite fine. Um, and this one does happen to be the, the red variety. The species name is escaping me at the moment, but um, there's only two leaves coming from this one particular base. So there would be one bulb at the base there and there would be one bulb on this little patch here. So it's two leaves on one bulb. So you really have to look where it goes into the ground. Um, the bulbs are kind of teardrop shape and I will, uh, I will try to set this here and hopefully don't have it fall over too much. Um, and I will try to dig up. Hmm. We'll dig some up with one hand, hopefully. Um, so just for a demonstration, this soil is pretty soft, fortunately. I'll do a little digging here. I'll try to get that bulb for you to see. Um, but that smell is so characteristic. Um, so that is probably the number one thing is do you even just break a little bit of the leaf and you smell onion? Uh, chances are you have, <clears throat> and it's this time of year, you have leek or something in the onion family. Now I and my family happen to love garlic and onions. So this is one of our favorites. We, um, we make pesto with it. Um, we pickle the bulbs. We use it as we would onions or garlic in cooking. So I've dug down now a couple inches. Um, and you can see I have not gotten to the bulb yet. So they're actually quite, quite deep. I'll dig a little bit more. I might just use my hands to dig now. It's one of those things where you dig, 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 and you get excited and then you pull and you pop it off. <laughs> so. There, I'm starting to see a little bit more of the bulb emerging. I'm gonna try to get down underneath the bulb. And work it out. There we go. Okay. So there is my ramp bulb. So it's not very big. That red kind of stopped at the top there. Okay. Chelsea, we got a there question we are. coming I'm in. Plant yeah. What do we got? Can you replant that bulb? Do you know if I there's did. any success to perfect? Yes, um, you can. And actually they um they transfer quite well. So if you you know have some private property that um, um there are ramps. My battery is getting a little low, so I might actually <laughs> I might actually hop in my car quick where my battery charger is because I don't want to lose you guys. Um, and we'll drive down 
to the next location. So we're gonna go for a little drive, guys. Zoom takes a lot of battery. This, this is all part of the fun. We're yeah. all, all in this together. <laughs> so as Chelsea is walking and, and jumping in her vehicle, um, if anyone has any questions about what we've we've talked about thus far, please let us know. Um, we had a couple questions. Everyone's joining us now. We were peacefully sleeping while Chelsea was, was on. All right. All right, guys. This is how it goes in classes. You never know what's gonna happen in nature, right? I had a full battery when we started. Okay. Let's go check out some more wild greens. So we're gonna go down to the bottom of the hill here. Um, I still have you guys, hopefully. Um, we're gonna go down to the bottom of the hill and look at a few, a few more species. So before I get too far though here, um, I am gonna jump out and show you the plant that is often confused for ramps. So this would be, this is a daylily species. I'll transfer, flip it around here. There we go. So this is what people see when they, they walk in the woods. There's like a nice green patch and they're so excited. Like, oh man, look at all those ramps. Um, but take a look at that stem. There's very clearly lots of leaves overlapping at the base. Um, it does still have the uh, parallel venation, but there is no, there is no um, onion smell with those. So those would be like your, your ditch lilies, the orange day lilies. Um, there are also edible components to that plant, but that is probably for another time. Okay. I don't have my seatbelt on, guys. Sorry. <laughs> this is why I picked this part because it was pretty easy access. So I'm glad I did. We're going to get to my favorite, favorite volleyball next. Okay, so unfortunately I'm going to have to keep kind of jumping back in the right here, um, but we're going to go take a look. So here, here we go. my favorite, favorite, favorite spring, there he is, I'm going to grab And we'll talk, talk about him from the vehicle so I don't lose you. Okay, let me get back in there. All right, so if you did not recognize that guy from the very quick grab, this is my favorite spring green. And no, I do not have my gloves on. This is singing nettle. So my absolute favorite spring green because it is so versatile um, and it grows pretty much everywhere. Um, this guy has a delicious, very similar to spinach green flavor, but unlike spinach, it actually holds its texture a little bit. So cooked spinach can be, well, it can be kind of slimy, honestly. And um, this guy maintains a little bit of texture, um, but the flavor is so fresh. It's like, um, oh no. Hopefully my screen's not frozen for everybody. You're back up, Chelsea. Oh, okay, perfect. 
So I love this green because um, it just has, if you like kale, if you like spinach, this is your go-to green. And it's again, one of those that if you pick it, most people aren't really gonna mind because um, it's also known as itchweed. Um, you can see, especially with the sunlight here, I'm gonna try to focus in on the stem. Again, sorry, we're having a, a car class here, but I don't wanna lose you from the battery. Oh. So you can very clearly see those hairs. Those are tr called trichomes. Um, and they're, they act a lot like um, little hypodermic needles. And so this is not a like um, poison ivy type situation where some people react and some people don't. It pretty much affects everybody. It's kind of just if you have built up a tolerance to it or not. Um, and so this plant has kind of a, a mix of chemicals that it will inject into you um, if you brush up against it. So I am, I am pretty tolerant of the stings from stinging nettle by now. Um, I honestly am not even feeling it, but it also could be because my hands are kind of cold <laughs> from this chilly day. Um, but the tops of the leaves, if you did forget your gloves and you want to harvest nettles, the top leaves do not have any smears on them. There's no trichomes there. And so what you can do, I'm gonna try to show you here. You can actually pick the plant by kind of folding and touching the top of the leaf and pulling it from the plant. There's no, no trichomes there and you will not get any stings from that. Um, now you may be wondering, okay, um, what, if it's so you know, kind of irritating, why would I wanna eat that? Um, well, those trichomes are activated. So that cooking could be a light saute. Um, that cooking could be boiled up with bleach. Um, some people even Hey all, we have Chelsea here still. She just dropped real quick, so we'll get her back up. Um, Chelsea, it looks like you're on mute if you're back with us. There, am I back? Yep, you are. Sorry guys. Man, all sorts of adventures today. Technology's lovely. So um, I was just saying, uh, okay, it's gonna make you itch. Why would I wanna eat it? Um, but cooking deactivates the stingers. And so um, any kind of blanch, saute, um, baking will deactivate. And then you're left with just the lovely green flavor of stinging nettles. Um, so a couple of ways that I like to use this plant, again, in a pesto, um, any dish that calls for spinach, um, I, I actually prefer stinging nettles myself, again, just because it holds its texture a little bit. Um, there is also later in the summer wood nettle. They are not in the same genus, but they are um, in the same family. So um, that actually is just as good. So you can have your stinging nettle in the spring and then toward midsummer, you can move on to your wood nettles. Um, although anecdotally, I have um, decided and we've done a few experiments with friends that the sting from wood nettle is much worse than stinging nettle. So um, just be prepared to actually have your gloves if you're harvesting that one later in the spring. Um, so this one for identification, it typically grows kind of in more open areas. Um, it's also kind of weedy. Um, so if there's been some disturbed soil uh, or anything like that, this will, um, this will crop up. So. The spring greens often will have this kind of um, reddish purpley tinge to them that helps them. It's almost like an antifreeze, um, especially since we've got last night and tonight, we're gonna get some freezes again. Um, it helps the plants in these early spring cooled temperatures. Um, extremely nutrient, nutrient dense, um, vitamin A, iron, um, all sorts of great minerals. So really, really good for you. Um, and it's easy to harvest. So you can just 
you can grab the whole plant um, and then strip the leaves and the very, um, the very tender tops, you can kind of just pull that whole top off there. So about where my thumb is from the top um, up, you kind of pop that off. Um, but just amazing, amazing things in there. Um, one thing to be caution, cautious of though, um, later in the season and as this plant matures, um, there will be a higher and higher concentration of um, oxalates in here. Um, so if anybody has any trouble with kidneys um, or kidney stones, you would want to try to avoid um, harvesting this plant um, later in the season. So springtime is when it's going to be lowest. And so that would be fine. Um, but do not harvest um, stinging nettle in the summertime um, just to avoid those high oxalate levels. So oxalic acid is another, another term for that. Chelsea? I got yes. a couple things for you. Um, can you show us again how you pick the stinging nettles by folding the leaf? I can. So um, the plant would be upright here. And if you come at it, I'll try to go from the side, but if sure. you come at it from the top and you just um, push down and fold that leaf over from the top, um, so you're only touching the top surface, and folding that leaf over is the best way to avoid because the stingers are on the underside here. So they're on the underside of that leaf. So if you can reach from the top and fold it over, you'll avoid those stings. Thank you. Or you can uh, be like me and always forget your gloves, um, even though you, you say you have them in your pack and you just get used to being stung. <laughs> so, um, but that's, that would be the preferred way is to, to grab it from the top. All right, two more questions for you. Um, on the stinging nettle, is the stem edible or only the leaves? Um, this stem um, is actually traditionally used for cordage. Um, so the stem can be quite tough. Now, like I said, the very tender top here. Um, so from about where my thumb is up. So I'm actually able to just pinch that off um, with my fingernail. Um, that little bit of stem is fine, um, but in general, I would stick to the leaves. It's not that it's not edible or there's anything wrong with it. It's just going to be pretty tough. Um, so I would, I would, um, and you can actually see see those strings. Hopefully, it's coming through the camera, okay? Yep. Um, but those, those that's, that's that's even from the top of the plant. So those strings are going to be um, in that stem and make it make it a little unpalatable when the leaves are so tender and tasty um, and usually so abundant wherever it's growing that I wouldn't bother with the stems. I would probably harvest it with the stem and all um, and then I would probably compost. I usually compost the stems when I'm done, so. All right, and other last questions? one for you. Um, are there, do you know of any other additional health benefits to eating things like nettles as opposed to spinach? Um, yeah, so that book um, that I showed earlier, the John Callis book, um, he has, a, he actually uses stinging nettles as a comparator for a lot of um, domestic greens. So spinach, kale, um, broccoli, those cabbage. And he, he breaks down and shows the nutritional value for spinach compared to those domestic foods. And on every um, parameter, everything that they're measuring, stinging nettles is like off the chart. So incredible health benefits. Um, now I'm not a doctor, I'm not an herbalist. Um, it's just these plants do have higher nutrition levels um, because it has been bred out of them. It hasn't, they haven't been bred for appearance or consistency for marketing. Um, and so they, they are retaining a lot of those good minerals and um, nutrients in the plant still um, that we've lost with some of our domestication. So um, that is a good reference. And um, I can try to, I'll ask John, I think um, I can copy that portion of his book and I can maybe um, forward that copy to you, Rachel, and um, we can pass that out if people are curious. But I will double check with John to make sure I can do that. So Thanks. Um, but yeah, it's it's Thanks. really quite amazing how high, uh, how high stinging nettles are in, in all those nutrients. Because you think of spinach and kale and those things as being really healthy for you, and then seeing the numbers compared, stinging nettles 
off the charts. Amazing. Okay, I'm going to jump out of the car and grab a couple more plants um, that I wanted to show you. So um, before our time is up here, um, looks like I've got about 15 minutes or so, and I will um, stick around for questions. Again, thanks for bearing with me on, uh, on improvising here. So I'm going to jump out and grab some more plants. There's a couple hanging out right here that I wanted to show. Okay. Now there were some over here. Um, I'm looking for a plant. The, unfortunately, the uh, flowers and the time of day is not helping either. Um, are closing up. So I'm looking for a plant that has some very small white flowers as most of the things do um, in the spring. So small whitish pink. Um, I was going to grab really quickly here. So I'll keep scanning while I'm going back for a different plant. Here's some more, more violets. Um, and for us here in Mitchell County, we do have a few patches, a few areas, um, like most people, but we do not have, I'm going to go knock on this log, knock on wood. We do not have um, too much of a problem with um, garlic mustard here, but that is a spring green that I would, I would encourage people to harvest. And when you, when you harvest that plant, harvest the whole thing. Um, don't leave any of the roots behind and then burn or really, really compost well any, any remains. So I'm gonna grab this plant here. I will take it back to the car so we can peek at it a little bit closer. And I'm gonna walk across the road here to try to find another plant really quickly. Um, so here we have some spring beauties and I'm going to pick some of them to show you. I'm just trying to show you we're in, in the field as it were here. Another common spring green that I want to talk to you about. This guy right here, super interesting flower. We are along the road, sorry about the road noise. Um, it's a park road though, not a, a road that has a lot of maintenance on it. So like I said, there's always garbage to find. Lovely dirty diaper. Use the diaper there. Okay, I think I think that will be good. Oh. Okay. I'm finding the plant that I knew was right down here on the edge really quickly. So um, I'm gonna go back to the car before I lose you with my battery. Okay. So I'm gonna get plugged back in here. There we go. So a couple of things that were, this is, this is again, And the flowers are all closed up today. This one was hey, a little bit open there. Um, five petals. Yes. Will you reintroduce the plant you're talking about now? Yep, this is Spring Beauty. So this will have five petals. Um, if you look really closely, and I know it's probably not going to show up here because it's kind of closed, but the petals have little um, darker pink or magenta stripes on them. 
and they are heliotropic. So they actually will follow the sun. Um, they will follow the sun across the sky through the woods like a sunflower does. Um, and these little guys have, and it, it didn't really pull up when I um, just grabbed them quick, but these little guys have bulbs on the end. So this would be um, where the bulb would have been. They have little tiny bulbs on the end that are edible. Um, and they typically will be carpeting the woodland floor. But um, this is an example of a plant that is kind of a fun little trail nibble, um, fun little, you know, did you know this? Or I can, you can eat this. Um, but as far as being able to harvest enough to actually make a meal and sustain you, um, you'd probably be burning more calories digging them, those little bulbs up. I mean, they are, the bulbs are the size, um, probably the size of this actual little flower here. So about half the size of my fingernail. They're very tiny. Um, they're quite tasty. They're a little bit sweet, a little bit nutty, um, but to be able to harvest enough of them to actually make it worth your time, um, not really not really on my list of things that I'm gonna spend time harvesting. Um, as with most things, the flowers are also edible, so you can add them to salads, um, but not a lot of color or flavor there. Um, so I tend to just like to see these guys blooming and they're a happy tree little, literal spring beauty in the springtime. Um, and they're also indicative of um, other good things to be found. So I also grabbed a plant um, that I wanted to talk to you about. This is a good plant for, um, for cross-referencing. So this is wild ginger. Um, it's got kind of unique shape. They're, they are almost heart-shaped leaves, um, but these lobes toward the top of the heart are very, it's cut very deep back um, to form that heart shape. And they are super fuzzy. This is the flower. And the flower is actually positioned, this is how it was growing on the side there. The flower is actually positioned on the ground because it prefers to be pollinated by um, ground beetles. And it's got that dark color. So it's not like a fancy, nice smelling flower. It doesn't really have a scent a whole lot. Um, but again, it's, it's wanting to attract beetles, not flying insects. So it doesn't have its flower waving up high overhead. Um, but this is wild ginger, and you can start to see the beginnings of the rhizome here. It is not related to the ginger that we think of like an Asian cooking or the dried ground ginger we might use in gingerbread, um, but it has some of the same aromatic components. So when you pick or dig this rhizome, um, it does smell a little bit like, um, like ginger. Um, this is a plant that has a lot of controversy on whether it's edible or not. Um, kind of in the same way that like sassafras does. So we don't actually use sassafras to make root beer anymore because one study one time showed that it had um, some carcinogenic properties. Same goes for wild ginger. So um, it's one of those plants that is kind of up to you on whether you would want to consume it or not. And you would use um, the root to flavor a dish, um, like an Asian dish, or you can even candy it and have like a candied ginger or a mock candied ginger. Um, but it does have some carcinogenic properties. So if you were eating any quantity of it, that would be something to be aware of. Um, and also, read up on it yourself and you can be the judge. Some people love to eat it. Some people um, think it's just terrible that it, it has any kind of um, negative property to it. And you should never even think about eating it. Um, I'm not gonna be the one to tell you either way. I just wanna caution you um, and let you know and give you that information. So I have eaten it um, more as just a kind of a novelty flavor. I made a, a wild ginger soda one time. Um, I've also used it to flavor a dish or two with some ginger flavor, um, but I've never had it in quantity and I don't harvest it every year. Um, it's just kind of 
kind of one of those things that if I see it and I think about it and I know what I want to use it in right away, I will. Um, but I do caution people on um, reading up on the different properties of wild ginger. I also really like it just because this flower is so interesting. I think it's really quite beautiful. Okay. Um, one more plant I'm going to grab quickly um, and I'll be right back to finish up. Hopefully I didn't lose you. We're still here. Yay. Everybody's springtime favorites. We have some bluebells here. So let me get plugged back in. We'll chat bluebells for just a second. And we can wrap it up here. Okay. Bluebells. This would be the other things portion of the show. So bluebells, um, when they are growing, it is truly a sight to behold. Um, it literally looks like there's an ocean of blue in the woods. Um, the location that I will be um, recording and doing my class from for the mushroom class has the sea of bluebells at the back. So that's kind of why I picked that location because we will be talking fungi and flowers. Um, but bluebells, this is one of the favorite things that kids that come on a hike with me remember is you get to eat the flowers. So um, bluebells do have some really nice um, nectar pockets toward the back of the bell. So I tell them to pluck the flower and you will have a little bit of that green calyx on the back, which you can eat. Um, when you eat it with the green on there, it kind of tastes like a sugar snap pea. But if you really want the sweetest, um, sweetest experiment or sp experience, I tell them to pull that green calyx off. And so you're left with just the little bit of um, white at the end of the tube. And that's the part that you stick in your mouth and give it a little munch. And you can really taste that sweet nectar um, waiting inside. So sorry, you're getting a close up of my dirty fingers but uh, it's part of foraging. So um, that is bluebells. Again, um, some other spring greens that we actually just don't have an abundance here that I really recommend. Um, dandelions, of course, um, all parts of dandelion are edible. Uh, garlic mustard, as I mentioned before, um, lamb's quarters, some of those weeds that are edible and quite tasty is a good one. And it's also a good excuse not to weed your garden. Um, because lamb's quarters often come up, come up in garden spaces, um, as well as purslane. So um, those are just a few names if you wanna research on your own. Um, but I'm gonna let, leave the last few minutes here for any questions, comments. Again, thank you so much for being uh, adaptable and coming along for a car ride with me. Uh, next class, I will make sure I have a backup battery. So let me know if you have any questions. So I'm gonna hop on the chat here. Hopefully I didn't miss anything. Um, let me see. So I had somebody ask when the mushroom class is. And I think that is, yeah, I was gonna say, I thought it was May 11th on bluebells. Um, the leaves, you can eat them. Um, I think the flowers are more fun personally. Um, so, oh, share any quick recipes. Yes. Um, so I will share um, back with Rachel and she can send out to you. Um, one of my favorite ways to use any spring greens. So no matter if you get a couple trout lily leaves, a couple um, bunches of nettles, a couple bunches of dandelion, you can toss them all together in what's called a hortopita. So my friend Ellen Dekos has a really delicious hortopita recipe. It literally translates to wild greens pie um, in Greek. And so it's basically phyllo dough filled with whatever wild greens mixture you can find, including a few ramps. Um, 
And so um, you get that garlic, you get the greens, you mix it with some olive oil and feta cheese and stuff it in between phyllo dough and bake it. Um, awesome, really, really good. Um, so I will share that. Um, another favorite greens recipe um, or spring greens recipe is making um, any kind of pasta with like nettles. Um, so if you've ever made homemade pasta, so you don't have to just stare out the car, the car here. Um, you could mix um, spinach into pasta and you'd use that same ratio of wild greens. So um, depending on which recipe you're using, it's something like a cup of cooked wild greens added into the pasta dough. Um, so it makes really fun, um, fun, pretty green, fresh dough to use um, in any lasagna or, um, or just a, any kind of noodle dish, especially if you have, um, especially if you have like morels to add into it is really nice. Um, third wild green recipe just off the top of my head, um, pizza or in salads. Um, easy, easy ways to use those wild greens that you can mix in anything. Um, so make your homemade regular pasta dough or uh, pizza dough and or botten, put some sauce on it, top it with all sorts of wild greens or mushrooms, whatever wild things you have um, that you found and bake it with some cheese. Going to be delicious. Um, same with salads. So you can add it to um, other greens that you have. So you can add it to lettuces um, or you could just make a big wild greens and flowers salad. Um, and I will talk more about flowers in my next, my next webinar if you're curious about that. So um, those are just off the top of my head really fun, easy recipes to start trying. Okay, other comments, let me see here. Chelsea, um, real quick yes. question about blanching nettles before you use or eat them. Someone's yes. heard about people can choke or have a reaction. Yes, so those trichomes are going to get you um, unless you deactivate them. So deactivating them um, is cooking. So blanching, uh, sauteing will deactivate those stingers, will de deactivate those trichomes so you can eat them, no problem. Again, at the beginning, I cautioned everybody has their own tolerances. So when you're trying any new food, wild or not, try just a little bit, see how your body likes it. Then the next time, try a little bit more. I wouldn't go and eat a gallon of nettles right off the bat um, just because first off, you might not like them. And second, wait for your body to adjust. Um, make sure you're giving yourself time to um, fully experience the flavors and watch for any, any reactions, just like you would with any new food, um, any domestic food. I would not want anybody to have any negative reactions to eating wild foods. Um, so yes, always cook your nettles before you eat them. Let me see if there was any more in the chat. Um, awesome. I see some people have tried a few things, especially with kids. That's great. Um, and yes, I will forward on my book recommendations, my, um, my recipes and favorite recipes for a newbie. Yeah. Those, those same, the horta pita pie is really good because you don't, you can use whatever amount of greens you find and you could just mix a whole hodgepodge of them together. Okay. Let me know if you have any other questions. Thank you for, again, being adaptable and uh, coming along with me today. Uh, hopefully, I will see quite a few of you, although I can't really see you. Um, I will know a few of you um, that jump on with the next couple, um, couple events. So we'll have the mushrooms up next. And then um, we'll have some more in the summer and another, another one in the fall. So thank you so much. I'll stay on for just a little bit in case there are any final questions. So again, everyone, Rachel with Iowa DNR, Chelsea with Mitchell County Conservation Board, we can't thank you enough for joining us this evening um, and bearing with us. Technology is a beautiful thing. Um, and and I think if nothing else, COVID has taught us roll with it and, and we'll, will enjoy it. So a um, couple things here real quick. I'm going to be sending out an email with the items that Chelsea mentioned. 
in it, we're also going to include, we kind of talked about that Mitchell County will be sponsoring or hosting a few different in-person um, edible courses coming up. So if you're looking to really get some hands-on experience and you're up in the North Country, um, head on over, see Chelsea in person and bring your coat, it sounds like, and maybe a snow hat. Um, but so one is coming up this weekend. And then we've talked a little bit about the mysterious morel and other spring fungi webinar going to be coming up May 11th, uh, 630 to 8. Um, same great time, same great place as they say. And then Chelsea will also be hosting a in-person um, class in regards to morels and fungi. So um, then we have some berries coming up this summer and then some more stuff this fall. So we're looking to expand and, and grow this. So if you have friends that you think will be interested, send them that Zoom link. Um, in, uh, it's about 8.02, so I'm gonna be cognizant of everyone's time. I know you all have other places to get to, but thank you again for joining us. We will hold on here another couple of minutes. If you have any questions, let us know. Um, and I will be sending the recording. It will be a, on YouTube. So feel free to send it out to whoever you wanna share it with. Um, yeah, anything else? Have a wonderful night. And thank you, uh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so if you want, feel free to add Mitchell County Conservation Board on Facebook. You can find me on Facebook. Um, Again, I'm happy, I will send my contact information to Rachel, but I am happy to answer any emails, questions, text messages. It's, it's always fun and exciting for me to, to answer those questions. So don't be afraid to ask. Um, and it makes me excited to know that you are out there looking and, and questioning and, and wanting to learn more and staying curious. So um, I'm always here, always here for you as far as wild edibles and nature questions are concerned. And for those of you that aren't part of it, join the Iowa Bow Facebook group. Uh, we post events like the ones that Chelsea's going to be hosting all the time. Um, so if anything's coming up in the world of outdoors in Iowa and female focused or female friendly and, and uh, family focused, we always post them. So if you see anything good coming up, post it to that page too, so we can get more eyes on it and get more folks enjoying our natural resources. So without further ado then, uh, on behalf of Chelsea and myself, thank you all. Have a great night and take care. Thank you.